Enactments. So if you're going back to youth, Brother Chris Jones, all the way from Oklahoma, Broken Bow tonight, going to minister to the teens back there. Sister Pam is out of town. She'll be back Sunday. And uh, so hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Anybody else going to the back? If not, you can turn in your Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 10. This will be part, whatever it is, two, I think, of uh, Sunday morning, recognizing what God gives when he takes away. So important, and instead of being focused on what we're losing, what it seems like we're losing, we need to be looking at what God's trying to add to our lives. Because he never removes anything, never takes anything away, allows something to be taken away that he's not planning something bigger and better. That's just who our God is, you know. You can't, you know, I might as well say this tonight. God never gives you what you ask for. He always gives you more than you ask for. I mean, you, you know, you pray for a wife or a husband or you pray for a job. God always gives you something more, more than you were expecting. That's just the way he is. He's, he's able, the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or even imagine in our minds. And that's just what, that's how good he is. He is a good God who loves taking care of his people. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just thankful to be one of them. Amen. Amen. Uh, Hebrews 10, let's just start in verse 1 there. Hebrews 10 and 1, we'll read about uh, a few, just about 10 verses. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And what he's referring to is back under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, when they brought all the animal sacrifices uh, to offer for their sins. And what they were doing was, in faith, they were offering the blood of animals that pointed to, to one day God sending his son that he promised to send the seed of the woman, the promise God gave in the Garden of Eden when man sinned. He, he came in the garden, he told Adam and Eve and the devil, the seed of the woman will crush your head, devil, and you will bruise his heel. That was literally the story of what would happen on the cross because at the cross Jesus crushed the head of the devil, took his power of death away, and at the cross Jesus was also bruised and wounded for our sins and iniquities, the guilt, the shame, the fear, and all that comes, everything that comes against us and all that we're guilty of. He takes the guilt, the shame, he takes it all away when we come to Christ and put our faith in him. You see, he is our representative man. If you try to represent yourself to God, you won't make it. You can never be good enough to get to heaven. Jesus is your ticket in or you won't be going. Amen. He's the only representative that God has sent to represent us to get us in. Jesus said that, and the only way to the Father is through the Son. So that's what he's talking about here. Those, he says those sacrifices, that never with those sacrifices uh, that could they make anybody perfect. So we see under the Old Covenant, nobody could be made perfect. And we know we're not perfect, but we are perfect in Christ. Our position in Christ is a perfect position. When the Lord looks at anybody that's saved, what he sees is his son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Even through our flaws and, and, and things that we're fighting through and, and things that are wrong in our lives, when God looks at us, he sees his son because it's his son, Jesus, that represents us. Amen. So, verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. He's saying here, if those sacrifices, the blood of animals, would have made them perfect, then they wouldn't have stopped offering them. They would have kept on offering. He goes on to say, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. And something else we can point out about this before we get to our text tonight is this, that the people under the old covenant never ever could have a pure, clean conscience. Never. Because the blood of animals could not do that complete work. Amen. It was temporary. The blood of animals was only temporary as a shadow, a type of what Jesus would do on the cross. 
How many of you know, and I know most of you do, when you died under the old covenant because the blood of animals couldn't complete what you needed to be complete, there was a place called paradise that people went to. It wasn't torment, but it was a place called Abraham's bosom. It was paradise. And that's where uh, Lazarus went when the rich man went to hell and saw Lazarus over there and said, could he just bring me a drop, one drop of water? And Abraham said, no, he can't come to you. You can't come to us. There's an abyss here. We can't cross. It's it. It's over. We are where we are. But when Jesus died on the cross, he went to paradise. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us this. And he captured those that were there unto himself and led them out but why how could he do that because his blood was not the blood of animals his blood was his blood pure blood without sin and when he died for us shedding his blood and dying then that was a perfect sacrifice and then he was able to go draw all those people out of paradise so the point here is we're reading is those sacrifices couldn't get the job done all they could do was point, if I offered a lamb under the Old Testament, God would see that my faith was really in the one he's promised to come one day. The animal wasn't my savior, but the seed of the woman's coming one day. How many of you know he came? His name is Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah! Verse 3, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. They knew they were sinners. They knew they were guilty. And every year they had to bring animal sacrifices. It was more than every year. But on one day every year, it was called the Day of Atonement, the high priest carried the blood into the Holy of Holies and put it on the mercy seat. And that's where God forgave the sins once again this year for the whole year. Amen. That's just the way God set it up because all that was symbolic and a big finger pointing to the cross one day. The Old Covenant, everything in the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of what you now have partaken of and are walking in. That's good news. We don't live in types and shadows anymore. We don't live in a mystery. You know, we live in the light. Amen. The, the light always uh, shined from heaven, and, and, it, and it always shined on what Jesus would come and do at the cross. But everything back behind the old covenant, behind the cross, was, you know, when light hits something, it makes a shadow. When the light from heaven would shine on the lamb slain, the cross, behind it was nothing but types and shadows. All the types and shadows. And Jesus said, the scriptures are about him. That's what the Bible's about. But when the cross took place, when Jesus died on the cross, everything that had been a type and a shadow now has come to life. We see that it was all about Jesus the whole time for those of us who were walking with our faith in the cross. Verse 4, notice a couple things that the Bible says here. For it is not possible, everybody say it's not possible, that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So here's something else we got going for us they didn't have going for them. The blood of animals only covered their sin for another season. But remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming up the Jordan. He said, behold the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. See, our, our sins are not covered by the blood. Our sins have, our sins have been Washed away by the blood. They are no more. God can't remember our sins because he's chosen to forget them. That's good news. So the reality is in the mind and the plan of God, once you're born again, you don't have a past. Then y'all ought to be running about now. Glory to God, you mean that's gone? And that's gone. God can't see it. That's good news. The Bible says he washes them away, that he forgets about them, that he puts them to sea and he buries them in the sea of forgetfulness, and that our sins are as far away from us as the east is from the west. That's, that's great news. The blood of animals couldn't do that, but the blood of Jesus has done that. And we have a clean conscience now. Amen. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, talking about Jesus coming into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body have you prepared me. 
Jesus was given a body by the Father, born of a virgin, not of men. See, that's, that's what made him the seed of the woman. Women don't have a seed. We, we men carry the reproductive seed. But in the Garden of Eden, when man fell and God rushed in, he gave the promise, the seed of the woman. He was, he was literally, they didn't know it, but he was in a way telling them, it's a virgin birth. Because women don't have the seed. So he gave them the whole story. They didn't understand it. They just had to believe there was somebody coming. God was sending somebody. And as long as they believed that, then they would offer the blood. Cain wouldn't do it. Abel would. And because Cain wouldn't go the way of God, what do people do that won't go the way of God? They try to kill the ones that are going the way of God. It may be with their lips they're trying to destroy them. Or it may be like Cain. It may be physically. They may kill because they refuse God's way and they're convicted of it. So they want to kill those who are submitted to God. So, verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. Well, you need to highlight that in your Bible. God never had pleasure. It's in your Bible right here. He never had pleasure. Let's look at it. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. Now look at verse 7. Then said I, this is prophetic of Jesus speaking here. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. This comes from Psalms 40, verse 7. That's where that comes from. He's just quoting that again here because it was spoken prophetically in the Psalms. And what Jesus say, the Psalms are about me. John 5, 39, you search the Scriptures, for in them you say you have life, but they are they which testify of me. That's what Jesus said. So here he writes this, and look, because this has everything to do with what we're about to get to about God taking away the first to establish the second. So watch this. He says, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Here's what you need to know. No man has ever done the will of God outside of Jesus. (coughs) You say, well, aren't I doing the will of God? Only if you're born again and in Christ. (coughs) And even that, we will mess up. Amen. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, you would not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Notice the sacrifices were offered by the law. (coughs) And the law, the Bible teaches, is a ministry of condemnation. So all of those folks were under law. The whole time. And it's a ministry of death and condemnation. Separation and condemnation. Are you with me? He says in verse 9 again. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It doesn't say once and for all. It says once. That means he did it one time and it was for all. You've got to be careful how you read that. Not just uh, once and for all. That's not what it says. It says once and for all. He did it for all. Not and for all. For all. He did it for he did it one time. Christ only had to die one time. His death was so pure. You know what made it pure? He was fully obedient. Fully obedient. He never sinned. He never had a sinful thought. He never committed a sinful deed. And when you hear that, you're just like, hmm. How can a man live 33 and a half years and never commit a sin, even think a sinful thought? Here's why. He was God. But he was also man. 
Okay, if he was man, how could he live that long and not sin? Number one is, he didn't have a sin nature like you were born with. He wasn't born with a sin nature because he wasn't born by a man. He was born by the Holy Spirit. And a virgin who had not known a man gave birth to Jesus. But yet he had a choice. As a man, he had a choice. So he had to choose every day to keep trusting his Father. Amen. And notice this when the Bible says in verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. That is the second time we read that. I come to do thy will. The doing away with the first that he might establish the second there in verse 9, he did away with the man that couldn't do the will of God and he brought in the one that can. He did away with the law for righteousness and brought the man on the scene that was our righteousness and became our righteousness, became the end of the law for righteousness, the man that did obey the law completely. He did away with what? Not only the law, he did away with us. You see, God didn't send his son to show up to make you a better person because that can't happen. You can't become a better person. The person that you and I are born into this life as is a sinner. Sinners can't get better. Jesus told Nicodemus to enter the kingdom or to even see it, you must be born again. Most people quote that and they leave out a real important part. When somebody tells you you got to be born again, that means you got to die for it to happen. And the way we die is not physically to get to heaven, it's spiritually. We die because we place our faith in the one who died for us. And the Bible says when we place our faith in Jesus and his death for us on the cross, that he represents us so well on the cross that in the mind and the plan of God, we were crucified with him. When God saw his son dying on the cross, he saw you dying with him. That's what the Bible teaches in Romans 6, 6 and Galatians 2, 20. That we were crucified with him. Don't you know the old man died, was crucified with Christ. That's what happens when you're born again. It's not about going to church and singing songs and putting money in the offering plate. That's going to church, singing songs and putting money in the plate. That's not being born again. Being born again is turning away from my sins, turning to Christ for forgiveness of my sins. And he does that, forgives me, and makes me a a new creation in him. I have brand new desires. I see things differently. I feel different now about everything. I have a whole new group of folks I hang out with. I don't listen to that that I used to listen to. I'm I'm leaving all that behind to follow Christ. That is a born-again believer. Everything else is not. Born again means I've turned away from sin and I'm following the one who forgave me through his death on the cross for my sin. So, I wanted to read this to you tonight. I wanted us to read this because he takes away the first that he might establish the second. And the second is the last. God's not got a third plan. Really don't have a second plan. It's all been one plan all along. We need to understand that God didn't go to plan B. It's always been by the blood. It's always been by the blood. The only thing that has changed are the benefits. And we read a few of those. Let me read some more of them to you. The Old Testament saints had faith. They did have faith. That's how they brought the animals to be sacrificed. Because they had faith in their God and what he promised them, a deliverer one day. And, but they were all under the law. Faith under the law caused a temporary and limited benefit. Were they not limited? Yes. They couldn't go to heaven when they died. They couldn't have a clean, pure conscience. And the list goes on and on and on. 
They couldn't be sanctified like we can. Inward, they could only sanctify the stuff in the temple. They could only sanctify. They couldn't be sanctified like we were because for us to be sanctified inwardly, we have to let the Lord be sanctified in us. He has to dwell in us. The Lord never dwelt in anybody for a, any more than for just a certain mission to take place. He didn't come to dwell in anybody permanently in the Old Covenant because they were under the law. Their blessings and benefits were limited, ours or not. You've got the whole plan of salvation offered you. Your relationship with the Lord, the closeness of your relationship with the Lord is up to you. If you're waiting on Him, you're going to be waiting. He's already provided His Son so that you could draw near to Him through your faith in the blood closer and closer every day. Trust in Him. Amen. Or oh me. Mm. We, we mentioned one of them a while ago. Sin, their sins were never taken away. They were just excused and covered for another period. Just excused and covered for another period. Oh, God was merciful. That was a mercy seat where the blood was put. But because it was the blood of animals, they were limited. When Jesus came, the limit was off. You got the whole, man, it's been dumped on you. God says he, he's attempting to load you with benefits every day. The Bible says in Romans 8, 32, If he spared not his only son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? What is it you need? What is it? All means all. Amen. Some people just can't believe it, though. And you've got to believe it to get it. Oh, I just don't know about that. Well, you just keep don't knowing and you won't get it. You just keep don'ting and you won't. But when you start believing, you're going to start getting. Amen. That's the way it works. With God, it's never, I'll show you, then I'll give it. No. That's not the way it works. You've got to believe to see. Jesus proved that when he told Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven or even see it until you're born Again, until you place faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. Then your eyes are open. Then you get to see. God doesn't operate the other way. You believe to receive. We don't live by sight. We live by faith. Amen. Just quoting scripture to you tonight. Amen. Going to get somewhere good here in a minute. Y'all ready for that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I want to show you something tonight. In, 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 uh, let's start, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 4. I know we read this scripture, but I want to read it this evening. We got a few minutes tonight, so y'all aren't short shouting me down and pushing on me. <laughs> Good to see you tonight, sissy. Everybody doing good? Everybody comfortable? We'll see what we can do about that. Mark 4, 23. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear, and with what measure you meet. Now I know in northeast Texas, that's like, what are you talking about? So let me read it. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, take heed, that means look at and regard what you hear. With what measure, that means a portion, limited portion, or a certain degree, you meet, and that means estimate or value. The word meet, M-E-T-E, means your estimation or your value of what you're hearing. You have to value God's Word. Every person who hears the gospel puts a value on it. Two people can sit on the front row 
And the gospel can be preached and we can point to Christ and what he did at Calvary. One of them can be saved and the other one can leave and say, I don't want any of that. Nah, it ain't for me. And it's, it's because one of them put a value on God's word and said, I believe it. And the other one put a value on it and said, I don't believe it. But they both valued it to a certain degree. They measured it. And listen, when you measure God's word, you're measuring it unto yourself. Let me read it again. And he said unto them, take heed. That means look at and regard what you hear. Don't just listen to folk tell you anything. Preachers that just get up on TV or in a pulpit somewhere and just tell you something and aren't using scripture, you better run from them. We were one of them preachers at one time. And we sit under them by the droves. But I thank God he brought us back to his word. Take heed, that means look at and regard what you hear with what measure, that means a limited portion or degree that you estimate or value what you're hearing, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. If you have, Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He said that on several occasions when he would begin to teach. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. What was he saying? Those who know who I am and will trust what I say, pay attention. That's what he was saying. Verse 25, because he that has, to him shall be given. And he that has not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. What's that mean? We Preachers and Christians, we for years used that out, out of context. Oh, you know the Bible says, he that has more will be given. He, yes, that's, Jesus taught that, but he's talking about hearing. And hearing is believing. Hearing is believing. He's not talking about with these, he's talking about with the heart. See, this is good. Now, what, what are we talking about here tonight? We're talking about God wants you to have more. He came, and all through the Old Covenant, God would find his people in a place, and what would he do? He'd shine the light a little brighter for them. He'd let them go through something else, or he'd put one of his people or a family of his people, something would happen where the light would shine a little bit brighter about the coming Redeemer, just a little bit more. God wants you to see a little bit more. He wants you to see a little bit more. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the just shines more as the perfect day approaches. That means the path we're walking on, the one we're being led by, it's getting brighter and brighter. We're not wondering, well, is this right? I don't know. No, it's getting brighter and brighter for us. We're becoming more... There's that word again, more sure of him and what he's accomplished and what he's doing for us right now and going to do than we've ever ever been before because he wants more for his people. And all through the old covenant, he provided just a little bit more revelation, just a little bit more revelation until one day the one the revelation was about came and they didn't even recognize him. Think of that. He says the entirety of the old covenant is about him. And when he showed up, they missed him. They missed him. They put him on a cross and hollered, crucify him. Pilate said, why why do you want me to crucify him? I find no fault with him. And they said, because he dares say he's made himself the son of God. That's just like them saying around here, they're stuck at the cross, and I say, say it again. See, they testify against themselves. He's made himself the Son of God. He was the Son of God. They constantly produce judgment on themselves by what they said. At the very end of his life, they cried out, let his blood be upon us. It has been. That's what the whole six million slaughter of Jews was about through God's instrument, Hitler. I said it just right, too. I said it just right, too. I said I said it just right, too. As long as they're rejecting Christ, he's rejecting them. 
The reason he's going to come back at the very end and, and land on that mountain and then be almost utterly annihilated. And you can read this in Zechariah chapter 13 and 14 and they're going to say, what are those holes in your hands and your side? He's going to say, I was wounded in the house of my brothers or my friends. And they're going to bow down and worship him as the Messiah who died 2,000 years ago on the cross for them and all men. But until that day, they're perishing. They're being killed and destroyed. You reject God, you reject the, all the help you'll ever need. Where are we? Here we are. Now, I wanted you to see that scripture in Mark because I'm, I'm, I, the Lord is trying to get us to see that wherever you are, He wants your eyesight to see more. He wants to give you more. He wants to bless you more. He wants to mature you more. He, everything that Jesus died for you to be able to have is for you to be able to increase every single day. The Bible teaches that the government that's on his shoulders will never have an end to its increase. That means this government that we're now in, I'm not talking about Trump nation now, and thank God for all that, but I'm talking about the kingdom of God, the big government, the one that matters over all because our king is king of all kings, Lord of all lords. And in this kingdom, it's without an end to its increase. We're to be growing and maturing and, and being more Christ-like. Amen. And we can through faith in Him. The possibility is there for all to grow. For all to become more Christ-like daily. Excuses we were without, the Bible says. So quit making them. Just repent and say, God, I'm sorry and help me. Amen. So now if you want to look real quick, i got a couple more scriptures. I'm going to teach you really something here at the end tonight, something that's going to really be a blessing to you. But before we're working our way there. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Proverbs chapter, chapter 2. This is probably my favorite portion of Proverbs is chapter 2. Because here in the second chapter, i got to take this off, I'm sorry. I know I'm dressed a little slouchy, but Lord knows my heart. He does. I'm not using that in a bad way. And I know y'all didn't expect me to wear a suit tonight because you ain't got one on either. Amen. Do as unto others as you would have. Okay, okay Proverbs chapter 2. And the reason I love this portion of Scripture, verses 3 through 6, is because we're going to see something profound in verse 6 tonight. The word wisdom is defined in these Scriptures, and I want to show it to you tonight. Now, we're talking about growing. The only way you can grow is through faith in the Word. You're not, listen, you're, you may be growing, the, the illustration I always give you when I was four years old and stuck tweezers in a light socket, I've never done that again, I grew past that at four. I was growing at four. At five, I knew not to ever do that again. But that wasn't growing spiritually. I mean, you, you, you grow in certain worldly things, but that don't mean you're growing with the Lord. And God wants you to grow, He wants you to become more mature in Him. It's about more. And the only way that happens is through faith in His Word. We walk by faith. We grow by faith. And faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the Word of God. If you're, listen, if your faith's not in the Word of God, in the context of what Jesus did for you at Calvary, it's faith that God won't honor. Because you can't just have faith in faith or faith in... You've got to have faith in what Jesus did at Calvary. Then you have eyes to see the Word and, and in a heart to believe the Word and, the, and believe it in the right context. And then the Holy Spirit can lead you and you understand what's going on. Let's get to this. Proverbs 2 and 3. Yea, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding... If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then shall you understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And the fear of the Lord simply means the value. that word again, that value. Your estimated value of God. That's the fear of the Lord. 
The word fear means reverential. All Bible scholars will put that in all their writings that the fear of the Lord is the reverential fear of God. You look the word reverential up, you break it down to revere, and it means how you respect or value or estimate something. You give something an estimated value of its worth. Somebody brings a rattlesnake in here, we're going to give it an estimated value that we got to get out of here. Or they do with that snake. So, the fear of the Lord is your, it's really your estimated value of God's worth. And you can't have that unless you look at the word and it points you to Calvary because in what Jesus did at the cross is, is, is what God gave so we could see how much he loves us, how gracious he is, how merciful he is, how loving he is, how long-suffering. Everything that God has for us flows through Christ and what he did at Calvary and we learn about it in the word and we grow more. We draw closer, we mature, but it all takes place out of this book. Not some other book, this book. Catholics done got their own Bible. Mormons ain't nine. I'm talking about people that are not Christians. They got their own book that's opposite from this book. This is the Word of God. We don't need another book. They've all, the reason they wrote their own book is because they don't believe this one. When you find the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the Watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the Catholic got their own Bible, it's because they don't believe in what's written here, the Bible. If you don't believe this, you'll go write your own too. I'm sticking with what God said. I don't care who gets mad and wants to run over me with a truck or whatever. I'm just going to hang on to God's Word under the bumper, glory to God. <laughs> hey! You can't go wrong with the Word of God. So, look at this. Now, notice verses 3 through 5 talk about you've got to be crying out. You've got to want to know. You've got to be asking. You've got to be seeking. You've got to be lifting your voice for understanding it. You don't just wake up one morning and know the things of God. First of all, you've got to get born again. Or you can't ever have anything. And once you're born again, then you been, begin to cry, I want to know you more. Moses did. He's being led by God, and the people of Israel are following him out in the wilderness, and he gets to a point. I mean, most people say, boy, that's pretty, pretty powerful what we've seen. God did all the miracles in Egypt and led us out. My Lord, that's good. But Moses didn't have enough. He said, show me your glory. More. Anybody that's really following the Lord, not people that say they are, but people that really are following Jesus, they want to know more. That's just one thing about following him. You want more. You, you, it's just something that he's working in you to want more. So you, you got to be crying out for it. And verse 4 says, if you seek for this, this wisdom, this knowledge, this understanding, as for hidden treasure. Folk buying lottery tickets every week, they ain't picked their Bible up one time. There it is right there. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody seeking, asking. Oh, but they wanting to get rich. Verse 6. No, notice now. For the Lord gives wisdom. How does he give wisdom? Anybody know how he gives wisdom? Through the word. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says Jesus was made unto us wisdom. Colossians chapter 2 says Jesus is the fullness of the treasures of all God's wisdom. In Christ is all the wisdom you'll ever need. But notice in verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, colon, everybody say colon. When you see a colon in the middle of a verse, God's getting ready to tell you how he does it. That's a colon, ain't it? What you laughing about? <laughs> You know, they'll make fun of me all the time. Monday night in here in prayer, I was reading along, and I said, male factor. <laughs> and I said, if it had been a woman, they'd have pushed them off a cliff. And Brother Jerry said, that word don't mean man. It means a, a, a criminal. <laughs> 
And then a couple of weeks ago in Wake Village, I, I was reading along and I said, the, slight, the, the slate of men in Bo's head, that's supposed to be slight. <laughs> I can't help I'm from decab. My mama did that to me. But uh, got to blame somebody. And uh, so anyway, for the Lord gives wisdom, colon, when you see a colon, God's getting ready to tell you. He's getting ready to explain what he just said. Notice, out of his mouth, what comes out of his mouth? His word. Out of his mouth, his word gives us knowledge and understanding. That's wisdom. What is wisdom? Understanding the knowledge of God. That's wisdom. Understanding the knowledge of God is wisdom. No, knowledge, knowing, and understanding God is wisdom. The Bible says in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they know, have knowledge of, the one true God and his Son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. So, now wait a minute. If knowing God, having the knowledge of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent, is eternal life, but we know we can't have eternal life without faith in what He did on the cross for us, that tells us that our only knowledge of God that saves us is our believing in what Christ did at Calvary. The only way that we can really have our knowledge opened up to God and have a, what, this wisdom that He wants to give us is if our faith is in what Christ, who is the wisdom, without the cross you have nothing. You can read this Bible and you can quote it for the next 90 years. You ain't getting nothing from God till you put your faith in the cross. And people can say they don't believe that, and that's fine. It's their prerogative. But I tell you what, they won't get anything from God. Everything from God comes through Christ and what he did at Calvary. You can't even worship God unless you're worshiping him with your faith in the cross. See, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son... You can't love him out here. He doesn't love you out here. He loves you only through the giving of his son. If you accept that, you get his love. Anything else, you don't get his love. And you can't love him back. The only love he has for you is through his son and the cross. The only way that you can love him back is through your faith in what he did in Jesus to love you. Everything else is just a feeling that he won't honor. It's just a feeling. Oh, I love God. I've loved God all my life. No, you hadn't. You wasn't born loving God. You was born a hater of God. And, and it doesn't matter if you never said, I hate God. No, you hated God. All sin is hatred toward God, and we were born sinners. You know, we go to the hospital, and we see the cute little baby. Little Henry was just born a couple weeks ago, and people say, oh, that's a cute little old baby. Somebody, I wonder if anybody's ever said, that's a cute little sinner. That's what he is. He's a little sinner. We were all born sinners. Right? This means right, and this means I don't believe it. When you're born, you're born a sinner. You have to be born again. So what the Lord's wanting us to know tonight is he wants to give you wisdom, but you're going to get it out of his word through faith in Christ. You see, you can't separate them. This is what we mean by you can't separate Christ from the cross. No, he's not still hanging on it. He's at the right hand of the Father. But your knowledge, your understanding, your faith must reside in what he did at Calvary. And then he opens your eyes to the Scripture so that your faith can be in the Word of God and that God's Word can now literally become a lamp to your feet and a light to your path, bread for you to eat every day. Glory to God. Y'all going to make me preach myself happy up in here tonight? Ain't you glad you came, sissy? <laughs> I'm messing with sissy. <laughs> Hadn't seen her in a while. Praise the Lord. One more thing I'm going to show you tonight. <laughs> one more thing. It's a good one, too. Man, the Lord taught me this this week. I, somehow, he had me over in the book of Isaiah. I don't even know how sometimes I get where I get. I'm studying, and I'm, this leads me to that, and that leads me to this, and I say, okay, Lord. This must be you. How many of you heard the phrase, Isaiah 28, if you're turning, precept upon precept, 
precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That means you're not getting it all tonight. God's going to give you just a little what? A, a limited portion. But boy, that limited portion, my Lord, it can cause you to move forward. I promise you this is about to be a great message. <laughs> I love what the Lord showed me here this, this week. Isaiah 28. Now, this chapter, of course, starts out with that horrible word, woe. Chapter 1. Isaiah 28 and 1. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is as a, as a, a fleeting flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hell, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower, and as the hasty fruit, therefore, before the summer, which when he that looks upon it sees while it is yet in his hand, he eats it up. He's talking about judgment here. He's talking, about, he's talking about an unfaithful people here. Judgment upon them. Look at verse 5. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sits in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Boy, I'd like to preach that sometime. I preached that 15 years ago. I remember it now that I'm reading it. That's good. But they also have erred through wine. Who, who's he scolding here? Folks drinking. Folks drinking. Better stay away from it. Verse 7. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Instead of being in the way of God, they're out of the way. They are, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. He's talking about his people right here. You see that? The priest and the prophet, his people, they, now they done gone to drinking. Churches all across America, they say, it's all right to drink. These towns that are voting in alcohol, most of the people voting it in are Christians. I'm going to leave my finger right there and tell you something. <laughs> A couple years ago when it first started here in Queen City, they started trying to vote alcohol in to sell it here in Atlanta. And I made some comment on Facebook against alcohol consumption by Christians. A couple of them just blew me out of the water. Christians. It ain't lost people. It's Christians. So the Lord told me what to write. And I wrote. Some of you may remember. And I put it in the newspaper. And they didn't bring alcohol into Queen City in Atlanta. And it was this. Whatever reasoning you give to drink is something you're denying Jesus to be able to do for you. Oh, I just want to be social. You're hanging around the wrong people. Oh, I just need a little courage. Jesus died to give you boldness. Oh, I just need peace and rest. Oh, he died to give you all that. So whatever you think you need a drink for, you're denying Christ. Every time you take a drink, you're denying Christ. Reading it right here, verse 7. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink and are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. See, they, don't, they can no longer see right. And it's not talking about they can't see and they're staggering around. It's talking about spiritually. They stumble in what? Judgment. Now, we're about to get into it. Here it comes. For all tables are full of vomit. There's not bread by the priests and the prophets anymore for the people. They're drunk. Their, their judgment is drunk. And Now look at this. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness 
so that there is no clean place. See, that's what alcohol does. Ain't no place for it. Now look at this. Who, verse 9, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Now, I don't have time to go into this. I'm almost out of time. But Hebrews 5 talks about how dangerous it is to stay a baby. It's good to be a baby Christian. Oh, thank God for new converts who are are baby Christians. But, oh, you better not stay a baby long. You better find some old preacher like Brother Curtis that's reminding you, you better be crying out to God for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. you got to keep crying out, Lord, I want you more than anything. I love you more than I love that old music I used to listen to. I love you more than anything I used to be bound in. I love you. You erased my past, gave me back my tomorrow. Hallelujah. I'm after you, Lord. I don't care about all that anymore. That's why you need to be listening to preachers preaching the truth, not these little Folks talking about the cowboys and political stuff in the pulpit. You need to be listening to people preaching the gospel. The word of God you need to be learning. Amen. Notice this. Let me read it again. We're going to roll right into it from verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Those who are maturing. But notice verse, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Notice he uses that scripture. Are you ready for this? He uses that scripture to describe how he will grow and mature and bring understanding of doctrine in his people. Did you see that? And precept, write this down, precept means commandment. And line means means a cord for measuring. Remember what we learned a while ago about how you measure his word? It's how you, how, how, it, it'll be, it, how you measure God's word will determine how you receive from God. So the word precept means commandment. So let's read it again. Verse, uh, verse 10. For commandment must be upon commandment, commandment upon commandment, line upon line, measure upon measure, measure upon measure, here a little and there a little. See, God doesn't give options, he gives commands. There's only one man that I know of that God ever showed up and asked, what do you want? And that was Solomon. Well, there is another couple. In the New Testament, remember we read it Sunday morning or last Wednesday night when the, uh, the disciples ran up to Jesus and said, we would that you give us whatever we ask. And Jesus said, okay, what you want. But he was leading them somewhere to the cup. <laughs> that was last Wednesday night. Are you getting this tonight? God doesn't show up and say, Curtis, uh, would you like to do this or this? He doesn't do that. He says, Curtis, do that. You know, you know why he doesn't give options? People who give options aren't sure. God doesn't have to give options because he sees into your tomorrow and he knows if he gives you direct instruction and you do it, you're going to be blessed in your tomorrow. Reason we give options because we just ain't quite sure. He's very sure. Now, Verse 11, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And that is a prophetic of tongues that would come into the New Testament church. But that ain't what I'm preaching, teaching about tonight. Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not, what? They would not hear. They would not measure. They would not measure properly this commandment that God was giving them. You better be careful. Remember Jesus taught, you better take heed how you hear. Not only how you hear, but what you hear. You have to measure what you hear and how you hear. Now let's look at this. Verse 13, we're closing here. 
but the word, now notice he ends verse 12, yet they would, they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. The word of the Lord was unto them, those that won't hear. It's still commandment upon commandment, commandment upon commandment, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Why? Look, at, here's, the, here's the opposite end of this. Instead of growing in your knowledge and understanding of the doctrine of God, look at the, this. Here a little and there a little that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. But notice this tonight. Both of these come by the word of the Lord. You can either measure it right and be blessed by it, or you can measure it wrong and be cursed. Don't mean God don't love you. It means you don't love him. Well, you can't tell me I don't love God. Jesus said, if you don't keep my word, you don't love me. See, I'm just old Bible preacher. People get mad at God all the time and take it out on me because they can't get to him. But don't worry, they're going to get to him one day. And greater than that, he's going to get to them. I want to show you this tonight because you can either be going for more through faith in the word, hearing God, or you can be going the opposite direction. You can become more ensnared and trapped by the bondages that are in the world, such as alcohol and, 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 all, and I won't list all the other things that are out there that hold people captive, trapped, snared. They can't serve God now. Oh, they can if they'll just repent and come back. But they're trapped now because they put the wrong measure, the wrong value on what God has said. Oh, that's not for me. That's, that's, that's for somebody else. Or, or this ain't the right time for all that. Whatever, it's either a yes or a no with God. It's, a later means no. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And that don't mean just your initial entrance into the kingdom. That don't mean just you being born again. That also means today is the day of my salvation. Every day I'm being saved. He's already saved me from hell. Now he's trying to save me from me. I'm my biggest problem. You are your biggest problem. That thing you've been pointing at is your big problem. That ain't your biggest problem. You are your biggest problem. The devil's not your biggest problem. You are your biggest problem. Proverbs chapter 4 teaches us that out of... Guard your heart with your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the issues of your life. But see, God's already got a remedy for every issue that'll come along. And it's what his son did for you at Calvary. If you have your faith in Jesus and what he did for you on that cross, that means that you're learning that he died for the guilt. He died for the shame. He died for everything that was contrary to you. He died for your sins, but that you also died with him. And now it's not the same person that's living. You've been born again. Now you have eyes to see. Now you can trust the Lord. You can learn the word. You can experience more of him every day. That's good news. That's not good news. Everybody who hears that and goes, oh, I don't know if I want all that. They're, see how they, they've measured it wrong. People that say, hey, you ain't got to go to church, you ain't got to give, you ain't got to do They've measured it wrong. If you're measuring it right, you say, I get to go to church, I get to give, I get to pray, I get to study, I get to serve God, hallelujah. All them folks that's running around saying, you ain't got to, I ain't got to. They put the wrong value on God. And their eyes are blurry because when you see what Christ did for you at Calvary, you're going to want to serve him. The excuses go out the window. It don't matter who you leave in the dust back there. Good friends, good relatives, it don't matter. When they see you living for God and they choose not to, you're going to have to walk on without them. And if you're not willing to, it's because you put the wrong value. It's time to start valuing God properly. Stand with me tonight.